y'all for being here tonight. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started, and let's start off with a word of prayer before we get into the class tonight. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for everybody in this room that you've uh, blessed us with the chance to be here uh, on a Wednesday night to come together and study your word. God, we just pray that you'll please continue to bless us and help us to get something out of uh, your scriptures, and, and pray that this will truly be something that uh, impacts our lives in a positive way. And God, if it does impact our lives, I pray that we will share it with others that we come into contact with, and just always seek to do your will uh, each day of our lives. We're so thankful for your son Jesus, who you sent to die on the cross for our sins, and who uh, was victorious over death. And uh, Lord, we're, we're just so thankful for him and his example, and what that means for us in our lives. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, this is my first time in the three years that I've been here at Creep Hall on a Wednesday night that I have not been with the youth group in their class and anything that they're doing. Sunday mornings, I'm usually out and about different classes. But Wednesday night, I've never been in a normal adult class. So I have no idea what goes on in a normal Wednesday night adult class here at Creep Hall. <laughs> Uh, so maybe this will be exactly how things normally are. Maybe it will be completely different. I don't know. Uh, but I, I appreciate the opportunity being able to speak to you all. Love teaching the youth group, but it's very different than teaching adults. We like to do a lot more interactive things and uh, maybe some games, things to keep them involved. We probably won't be playing any games here with you guys. I don't know if that's a bummer, but uh, I do appreciate uh, you guys being here, and hopefully we'll have some questions to get maybe a little bit of discussion going here in a little bit. Um, but we're talking about life-giving or life-altering passages. And when you think about the Bible, there are hundreds, thousands of uh, life-giving, life-altering passages that you can choose from. And so Andy and I have kind of been picking and choosing some of the ones that we wanted to focus on. And I posted on Facebook earlier this week and just asked... Uh, people what their favorite life-giving passages were. And I got 43 different comments that I kind of scrolled through and looked at all of those and uh, used some of those tonight and maybe we'll use some of those in the future. But I did bring this clipboard and piece of paper. I would love if you guys have any passages that you have in mind that you really think are powerful that you would like to talk about, go ahead and write that down and maybe in the future we can add that to one of our classes. But I'm gonna pass it around and give you guys a chance. You don't have to put your name if you don't want to, but you can add a passage on there, and maybe we'll spend some time looking at it together. Tonight, if you would, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at verses 31 through 39. Now, honestly, if we're talking about just passages that we hear about quite a bit, passages that are that are brought up frequently, you could almost look at the entire chapter of Romans chapter 8 because it's full of great life-giving and life-altering passages. But we're just going to focus on these last nine verses together tonight. And I want to start off by just reading those together. And I want you to think about what these verses mean to you and kind of how these verses make you feel. So let's start Romans chapter 8, verse 31. It says, What shall, then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously, graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. After reading that for the first time, I want you guys to tell me, what are some things that those verses make you feel? What are maybe some thoughts after reading it through together? It's very encouraging. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, nothing's going to separate us. Yeah. It's like he's got our back. That's right. Try to get you through tribulation. I 
remember when 9 11 happened, uh, this is a scripture we went to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is very encouraging that no matter what is going on in your life, nothing can pull you away from that love. What else? What are some other thoughts? Other feelings? Because you can conquer this. somebody there with us. What else? I would say it's very spiritually uplifting, just knowing that God is on our side. Yeah, it is uplifting. Let's start with verse 31, and I just want to walk through these one verse at a time and just figure out and and wholeness exactly what God is telling us through these verses, exactly what Paul was trying to communicate to the church there at Rome when he was writing this letter to them. If you read verse 31 with me, it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? You can almost stop right there, and that in itself would be enough of a life-giving passage. No one can be victorious over us. That is what this verse is telling us. Nobody can be victorious over us. Having a good teammate makes us feel good. It makes us feel confident, as you all have said. I, I want to ask you guys a question. If you could choose anybody in the church to hold you accountable for your faith, who would you choose? Maybe some people that you have in mind. If you could choose anybody in the church to hold you accountable for your faith, who would you choose? Like a specific Person? Yeah, a specific person who you look up to and you feel like could hold you accountable that you would love to have on your team. So the elder that's responsible for me is Andy Richter. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I was going to say, uh, I mean, there's there's several elders I, could, I was thinking of as well, but uh, uh, Bubba Ingram specifically rings a bell. Mm-hmm. As far as just someone, someone I very much look up to, going back to my years when I was going to the yacht class. Yeah. The classes he taught were just were very memorable That's for good. me. Anybody else? I've always looked up to Tim. I mean, just his humility and his, his example. I mean, for years he's, he's been a mentor to me. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a friend uh, back in Buford, Georgia. He's an evangelism minister, and, and when I was in the youth group, he was an intern for several years, and we have a really good friendship. Uh, he's, he's a great man of God, but one thing that I can always count on him for is he's going to tell things how they are. So I know that if there was ever a time where down the line for some reason I, I fell away or I wasn't doing things as I should, I wouldn't be surprised if, if he drove four hours and ended up on my doorstep just trying to get me back on the right path. Uh, Albert, you mentioned Tim. You know, Tim is a great mentor to me as well here at Creek Ball. I know he is to so many different people. But it makes us feel good when we have those people on our team. Wouldn't it give you more confidence to know that that person is there with you? That that person you mentioned is holding you accountable? That that person is fighting on your side? Uh, think about with your sports teams, okay? If you think about the Tennessee Titans. What if you knew that the Tennessee Titans could sign... Patrick Mahomes, Christian McCaffrey right now, okay? Wouldn't you jump at that opportunity to have a franchise quarterback, to have a franchise running back on your team? Wouldn't you feel a little better about your team's chances this upcoming season if you knew that you had those two on your team? Uh, a couple years ago at church camp with our theme that was the Lord's Army, I know that uh, Albert and Shelley went around all week and would ask the questions on our, on our video camera throughout the week. Uh, if you could have anybody fight with you in the Lord's Army, who would it be? And you got a lot of different answers. Samson was a pretty popular one. Peter, because he's so passionate, and, and a lot of different answers from a lot of different people. If you could choose somebody to be with you on the Lord's Army and fight alongside you, who would that be? Well, how about God himself fighting on your team? The creator of this universe. The person who created you and me, who put everything into place. The person who is perfect, who is wholly divine, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, to know that that person 
that God is on your team. We have the greatest teammate that anybody could ever ask for. And if that doesn't give us confidence to know that he is fighting on our side, then I don't know what will. If God is for us, who could be against us? Turn with me to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Leading up to this moment, of course, in the story of Job, we know that Job was a man of God, and, and God allowed Satan to come after Job. And it just seemed like no matter what Satan threw at Job, he wasn't going to give up on God. But despite not giving up on God, he still had a lot of questions. And he really wanted to know why God was allowing these things to happen to him. He thought that he was living his life well. He thought that he was living as righteously as he possibly could. And he had questioned God quite a bit in the chapters leading up to chapter 38. And finally, after all these things that Job says, God answers Job in chapter 38, verses 1 through 7. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. God is coming back at Job and saying, I'm sorry, were you there at the beginning when I created all these things? Were you there when I put the earth into its place, when I decided its measurements? And by the way, extremely precisely allowed for life on earth here around us. God comes back at Job and, and basically goes chapters, several chapters long. He goes through thing and thing again, over and over again, asking Job, well, where were you when I were creating all these things? This is probably a couple minutes that it took God to say this to Job, but for Job, it probably felt like an eternity to have the Lord sitting there firing back at him, questioning him, saying, where were you during all these times? And so finally, in, in chapter 40, Starting in verse 3, after the Lord goes through all these things, Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am a small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no farther. And Job says, Listen, clearly I'm out of my league. I made a mistake. I should have never questioned you. I, I just need to stop talking, is what he says. And God, in verse 6, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. And God comes back and says, No, this is what you wanted. You wanted the answers. So he says, You need to dress up like a man, and it's, it's time. You're going to get your answers. And he comes back at him again and, and continues to talk about his power and his omniscience and his omnipotence. And finally, in chapter 42, this is kind of the conclusion that Job came to. Chapter 42 says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, in verse 2, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Job had a lot of questions. He didn't know exactly why the things that were happening to him were happening. And finally, it, it took God going through this several-minute spiel over all the things that he created and put into place for Job finally to realize who am I to question the Lord? God, you put me here on this earth. You created the earth around me. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. Nobody can be against us because we have God on our side. Let's keep reading Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It says there at the end, also with him graciously give us all things. What do you think that means? What do you think it means that God says he will graciously give us all things? Seeking you shall 
time, you know, to all that, you know, God provides for, if he provides for the birds and the, and the air system, he's going to provide for us. Yeah, he's going to provide for us. Now, does this mean that he is going to give us every single thing that we ask for? That he's going to answer every prayer with a, a hearty yes immediately? We know that that's not the case because I'm sure all of us have a time when we have earnestly prayed for something and maybe things have not gone the way that we wanted it to. But what he's saying to us here is at the beginning of verse 32, he did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. If God is even willing to give up his own son for us, then certainly he is going to give us everything that we need that is essential to life and salvation. In other words, if God is willing to give up his own son, he's not going to send his son in vain. And so he's not going to send his son to die on the cross for us, but then not give us what, what other things we need in order to be saved. Paul is telling them that, listen, God has graciously given you everything that you could possibly need to spend eternity with him. He's not going to leave you hanging. And he may not give you everything that you want, but he will give you everything that you need. And you may say, well, you know, I don't want to serve a God like that, but what kind of parent would you be if you gave your child every single thing that they asked for? Good or bad, anything that they asked for, if you just gave them a yes and let them do it. Chances are, your child is not going to grow up to follow the ways of the Lord. Chances are, your child is going to do a lot of things that are very harmful to them, because as a parent, sometimes they don't know What's better? And so God may not give you every single material thing that you ask for, but he will give you everything that you need. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Everything good, everything that we need for salvation, God will make sure that we have. Let's keep reading in verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. This verse is telling us that only God's judgment matters. That so many other people can, can come at you bringing different things. Satan's going to try to accuse you of different things. Satan's going to try to pull you one way or the other. But he says that only God justifies. He is the sovereign judge. If you want to picture a courtroom scene where you're laying out on trial, God is the ultimate judge. He's making the final decision. He doesn't have to entertain counter evidence. No one else gets to say over him. It's up to him as the judge. There's no higher court to appeal to because God, the sovereign judge, is the one who justifies us. If you would, let's turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, I want to look at verses 1 through 9 together. By the way, when I said I posted that on Facebook for people to write passages, uh, there were so many passages that were written. A lot of the passages that I referenced throughout tonight are other powerful passages that people have suggested. So these are all passages with so much meaning that you can pull from them. Joshua chapter 1, uh, I want to specifically... You can look at all verses 1 through 9, but I want to focus in on verses 5 through 7. Well, let's start with verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now skip with me to verse 5 as he, as he commands Joshua to take charge. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. So God is telling Joshua, he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. This person that has led my people, this person that it is thought of as almost a God to himself for all the Israelites, the way that they looked up to him. He was a mentor to Joshua and kind of led him through what he needed to do in order to step up as the next leader. This person has passed on, and now, Joshua, it's up to you 
to take the reins. And, jo- and God says to Joshua to help him through this in verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all days of your life. For just as I was with Moses, I will also be with you. He's saying the same thing that Paul is writing to the church here in Rome. That no one else can stand up against you because I am the sovereign judge and I am on your side. But in order for me to continue to be with you, you need to do a few things. You need to be strong and courageous. You need to make sure that you're following the law and not turning to the right or to our left. Satan, our enemies, uh, the the rest of the world is not going to get the final say. So another thing that we can pull from this is don't try to please others because God is the only one that you need to please. His judgment is the only one that really matters. Uh, I want you to imagine a, a school classroom and maybe a student chose not to do their homework and so they got a zero on that assignment. And upon finding out that they were going to get a zero the next day in class, stands up to the class and delivers an incredible speech to his classmates about, listen, you know how terrible it is to have to do homework. You know how we have homework from seven seven different classes every single night and that there's no way we could possibly do it all. And I've chosen not to do it tonight to focus on things that are more important, so I think I shouldn't get a zero on this grade. And all of his classmates could be cheering for him to think that's awesome. They could relate to him. They could be sympathetic to him until the teacher behind him says, you need to be talking to me because I'm the only one whose opinion really matters here. Okay, he's trying to please the people who aren't going to be able to judge him in the end. We have all these people in our lives, and especially in, in this age of social media, who it's all about how we look. It's this world of image. It's all about what others think of us. But the problem is with comparison to others, it doesn't matter how we line up with others. It only matters how we choose to serve God. Those people are not going to be able to bring a charge against us in the end, but it's only God who is a sovereign judge. Let's keep reading in verse 34 of Romans chapter 8. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. I'm going to ask you all a question, and maybe I'll give you some time to think about this. Have you ever had somebody who vouched for you? Can you think of a time where maybe somebody stood up on your behalf? While you're thinking, I'll I'll give you a, a couple examples When I was in college uh, at Free Hardman for my last two years, our our social club had elections every year where you would elect people to fill the different positions for that social club. And before my senior year, I ran for chaplain. And the way those elections would go is that uh, every time somebody would go to run for a position, before uh, they would even decide who is going to get those positions, you would give a speech for yourself. Everybody who was wanting to be elected would leave the room. And then you would have somebody who would vouch on your behalf, who would speak up for you and tell the others why they thought you would be a good candidate for that position. And before uh, my senior year, I went for chaplain, and I had one of Amelia's friends actually vouch for me, because of course I could have gotten Amelia, but it doesn't mean much when your own girlfriend is, you know, vouching for you. Obviously, she's going to stand up for you. But it was instead one of her friends, and I probably got that position because of what she said about me. Because of her standing up for my behalf, that means a lot to people if that's somebody who they respect and look up to. In the same way, after I interned here in the summer of 2020, um, there was obviously an opening in the youth ministry position. And that summer, uh, COVID summer, was Bennett Walden and Derek Griffins. It was after their senior year. And I know that they went to some of the elders after that summer and said, hey, we would love to have Isaac as our youth minister. They've told me about it, and I know that they've done it. And that means a lot to have somebody who's willing to stand up for you. So with all that being said, can you guys think of any examples where somebody has vouched for you or stood up on your behalf? I was kind of someone that uh, just related to the job. job and uh, for quite some time and uh, 
he had an op there was opportunities where he would work. Uh, and uh, and this is a guy, Glenn Wilson, who uh, recently passed away. But he uh, he he uh, it was a position I was getting in for accounting at that time. I had some th other things, and uh, and he uh, went to the plant manager and uh, assured the guy that I'd be the one. Uh, it was a manufacturing accounting position, assured him that I, I could do the job. And, uh, and then he also told told me. And encouraged me to go ahead and pursue it, and uh, I know he had laid a lot of the groundwork. So uh, yeah, that's actually how I got into the county. Yeah. So uh, I uh, uh, I appreciate having him as an advocate. That way. Yeah, somebody who's got influence. It means a lot. Any other examples you all can think of? This verse tells us that Jesus is interceding for us on our behalf. He's vouching for us. The first half of this verse kind of gives us his credentials. It tells us his authority. The second half of the verse tells us what he's doing with those credentials. Jesus died on the cross for our sin. More than that, he was raised. He's now sitting at the right hand of God, and he's interceding for us on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says, some of the same things that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, who's there vouching for us. That's incredible. That's an awesome uh, thing that we have as Christians. It's like if you knew somebody who was in the White House and you really didn't like how things were going in our country, and you can call them up and say, hey, maybe you can mention this to the president. It's having an inside man. It's having... A press pass to get through security. We have a guy that's on the inside for us, sitting right at the right hand of God, who's constantly vouching and standing up on our behalf to the throne of God. That's encouraging. That should give us confidence and assurance in our hope. Let's keep reading in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. These verses are telling us that nothing can pull us away from Christ's love. These are all very personal things to the people at this time, things that they were probably had dealt with in their past. Persecution, certainly, in that area. Famine, nakedness, worrying about just the necessities of life, danger, or the sword. These are all things that they were constantly dealing with, and it's very personal to them. I'm going to ask you all, is there anything maybe today that you could think of that you could add to this list? What are some things that we might add to this list today? Some of these things we may not be dealing with on a daily basis. We're not, in any, any time soon, going to have to deal with a famine, more than likely, or danger, or, or the sword. A lot of us are not having to deal with the basic necessities of life, but there are always trials and tribulations that we're having to deal with on a daily basis. Sometimes bigger things come along, sometimes it, it's easier things uh, that we're dealing with, but regardless, we have things that are trying to pull us away from our foundation. Should public opinion, a, a loss of a job, a loss of a family member, maybe if you think there's increasing evil in the country, discrimination against Christians, the threat of a war, a, a pandemic very recently, should any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? Of course not. They can't. These, these are all trials that we have to face today the question is, what will your outlook be on those trials? Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This is another uh, passage that somebody added to our, our Facebook post. If you could read, second, if I could get somebody to read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 for me, please. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. 
for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look at not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Thank you. We do not lose heart, because even though our outer self, even though that the things in this life may be wasting away our inner self, our soul, our spirit is being renewed day by day. It says for this light momentary affliction. And, and when it says that, it's not to discredit our suffering. It's not to make light of what you're going through. But it's to remind you of how incredible the reward is that we have ahead of us. In comparison to what we have ahead of us, these are just light momentary afflictions. We don't lose heart because none of the things we have listed can pull us away from Christ's love. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, saying a similar message. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through God, with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has, who has given it to us. We not only will endure these sufferings, but Paul tells us that we should rejoice in them. As these verses and the ones in 2 Corinthians told us, Suffering leads to hope. And that doesn't seem like those two things should go together. Suffering and hope seem counterintuitive. Paul tells us that suffering should lead to hope. How? Because suffering leads to endurance. Endurance leads to character. And producing character reminds us that this life is just temporary. Producing character reminds us that these things have no eternal effect on us. Producing character reminds us that no matter how hard things get, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And therefore, that character leads to hope. All of us have difficult situations that we have gone through in our lives, and probably things coming up in the future as well. I won't ask you to list those things, but I want you to think about a difficult situation that you have faced in your life. And then think about how you got through it. I went through a very difficult family situation my senior year of high school. And what got me through that situation was the church, God's people. Uh, people doing things that I know were not convenient to them. People doing things and, and stepping up that I had never seen before. And the love of the church uh, was shown to me in an incredible way at that time, and maybe you can relate to that. But because of that suffering, I saw the love of Christ shown through the church, and that's something that can never be taken away from us. No matter how hard times get, no matter what you're going through, that love of Christ is still there. Let's keep reading in verses 36 and 37. Romans chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul is answering in verse 37. He's answering his own question from verse 35. He was asking, should any of these things separate us from the love of Christ? He's talking in references a verse from Psalms that's talking about how we're being killed all the day long, we're regarded as sheep. To be slaughtered, he's saying, can any of these things separate us? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. What does it mean to be more than conquerors? If you think about it, all earthly conquerors, all of the, the people who you can think of in times past, if you can think all the way back to your history class and think of people like Alexander the Great, who conquered all these great nations, every single one of those people had their reign come to the end. Either through being conquered by somebody else, or through death, their reign, their dynasty came to an end. 
we become more than conquerors because we can't ever be conquered by anything else. There's nothing that can conquer us. Even what seems to be the end, death, we can have victory over because of the love of Christ. We are more than conquerors through Christ. How can we do that? The last verse I want to flip to is Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, another passage that somebody suggested, verses 8 through 10. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are the household of faith. In order to become more than conquerors, we have to sow to the Spirit. We have to never give up. We have to never grow weary of doing good. And if we do this, God has promised us that we will become more than conquerors. Let's finish with verses 38 and 39 of Romans chapter 8. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about what Paul is saying here, the things that he's listing. Neither death nor life. Our life, nothing that's happening in our life. Or if you think about the worst thing that could possibly happen to you in people's eyes, death, not even death, can separate us. Nor angels, nor rulers. Angels were looked at as an extremely high up being, as somebody who any time they would encounter an angel, a lot of times we see them fall on their face in fear. We see them completely afraid of how powerful this angel is. Rulers, the people who are in charge, the people who are over their nation, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, not things in this life, or things to come in the future, nor powers or principalities, your version might say. That's talking about no evil uh, powers in this world. Demons, Satan, nobody can pull you away from that love. Nor height. If you looked up as far as you could see and looked up to the sun, the moon, the stars. If you saw the solar eclipse the other day. Maybe you saw two at once. Okay, You're looking up as, as far as you could see. Or depth if you're on the, the top of a mountain and you looked as far as your eye could see. Nothing else in all creation to sum it up will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will ever be able to separate us from that love. Not here, not at this time right now, or in the future. If this passage doesn't change your outlook on life, if this passage doesn't give you hope in this life, then I don't know what will. We have a God who is with us on our team who has promised us that we can be more than conquerors through him, and that no matter what we face, nothing will be able to separate us from his love. That's a, that's a powerful passage. That's a life-giving passage, a life-altering passage. To share just a few final takeaways from what we've covered, we have no reason to hope, or no reason to fear, but we have every reason to hope. We're going to go through sufferings, but they in themselves don't have any eternal impact on us. They can't pull us one way or another. And we have a reason for hope. We have a reward that we're looking for in the end. We're already more than conquerors, and one day we will even conquer death, and then we will get to enjoy our eternal reward. Nothing can pull us away from that. Nothing can pull us away from Christ's love that he shows to us. I hope that all of us together, I hope that we never forget that. I hope that you let these verses change your life. And I hope that it compels you not only yourself to be changed, but to share that news with somebody else who also could use it. And if you're going through a rough patch right now in your life and, and you need it, I hope that this passage gives you life and serves as an encouragement to make it just one more day. Let's go ahead and close out with a word of prayer. We'll be on our way. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for uh, these, these verses that we've read together tonight. We thank you for the letter that we have to the, the church in Rome that Paul has written. 
and for the wisdom that you shared with us. And we thank you so much for the encouraging words that your scriptures have shown to us tonight. We thank you for your son Jesus, for interceding on our behalf, for standing up for us and vouching for us. And we thank you for his love that can never be taken away from us. I pray that we'll allow that to change our lives and that we'll share that news with others who need to hear it as well. And God, if, if there's anybody in this room that's struggling right now, either with their faith or something else that's going on in their life, I pray that you'll strengthen them, that you'll encourage them, and that you'll show them your love, which can't be compared with anything else. So thank you for uh, just allowing us to be here. I pray that you'll give us safe travels on the way home. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.